Hello and welcome to the course on Environment, Health and Safety, EHS. This course is designed for facility managers to learn the importance of EHS, its associated hazards, prevention and control methodologies and PPE. By the end of this course, you should be able to understand what EHS is and why it is required, learn various prevention and control measures, Overview of Occupational Health and Safety, that is OHS, including General Facility Design and Operation, Communication, Physical and Chemical Hazards. Examine Different PPE Techniques and Hazards. Learn Various EHS Inspection Priorities. Understand How EHS Impacts the Businesses. Determine Conditions that Should Be Reported. So, let's get started. The Environment, Health and Safety, that is EHS function, also referred to as HSE at times in a facility, promotes and ensures a responsible and healthy safety culture in the premises targeted at protecting the employees, public and environment from any harm. The function is responsible for the protection of environment and occupational health and safety and takes into account the rules statutory laws and best practices to develop processes and methodologies for safe occupancy of the facility. Objectives of EHS Function EHS has two distinct objectives. First, prevention of incidents or accidents due to deviation from normal operating conditions. And second, reduction of adverse effects resulting from normal operating conditions. Some of the scenarios where EHS functions are helpful include protecting employees from job-related injuries and illnesses, preventing accidents and fires, planning for emergencies and emergency medical procedures, identifying and controlling physical, chemical and biological hazards in the workplace, communicating potential hazards to employees and maintaining a sanitary environment. Now. How do the organizations ensure that EHS objectives are achieved? For this, the organization needs to educate building occupants and staff, perform regular auditing and monitoring, perform technical consultation, establish safe processes and procedures, create risk management plans, etc. on an ongoing basis. Let us explore some of the examples of what is covered under the EHS ambit. Some of the examples related to environment are wastewater treatment, emissions from equipment, indoor air quality, noise pollution, waste management, hazardous material management. Some of the examples related to occupational health and safety are water quality, electrical safety, fire safety, safe work methods, precautionary and informational signage, physical, chemical, biological hazards, disease prevention, emergency plans and response. Let us understand why EHS plays such a crucial part in an organization. Environment, health and safety works to minimize or prevent occupational injuries and illnesses and protect and improve the quality of the workplace and surrounding environment. EHS helps in reviewing regulations and developing facility policies and programs accordingly, providing guidance and technical assistance in identifying, evaluating and correcting health and safety hazards. Providing training materials, assistance and programs in safe work practices. Monitoring facility operations to help ensure safety policies or procedures are in place. Providing and coordinating emergency services for hazardous materials incidents. Serving as official liaison with governmental and other regulatory agencies. The primary benefit of EHS and Workplace EHS programs is the obvious one. It helps in preventing incidents such as injuries, illnesses and harmful environmental releases. 
one of the classic and most horrible historic examples of an incident that showed the need for EHS efforts was the Triangle Shirt Waist Fire. Other well-known and more recent examples include the Bhopal Union Carbide Explosion in 1984, the Upper Big Branch Mine South Explosion of 2010, the BP Deepwater Horizon Oil Spill of 2010, and the fire in and ultimate collapse of the Sava building in Bangladesh in 2013. Because these hazards are real, EHS programs are necessary and provide real benefits. The responsibilities of an EHS manager are many and may include running the safety and health management program, performing job hazard analysis, performing incident investigations, help run safety committees, ensure that environmental health and safety training is delivered, ensure EHS regulatory compliance, performing worksite walkthroughs and safety observations, and much more. Prevention and control measures in organization plays an important role. The application of prevention and control measures to occupational hazards should be based on comprehensive job safety or job hazard analysis. The results of these analyses should be prioritized as part of an action plan based on the likelihood and severity of the consequence of exposure to the identified hazards. Let us now understand various prevention and control measures. The preventive and protective measures should be introduced according to the following order of priority. First, the organization should eliminate the hazard by removing the activity from the work process. Examples include removal of hazardous equipment or component. Second, the substances or material should be substituted with a less hazardous substance or material. Examples include substitution of a chemical with a less hazardous chemical. Third, the organization should control the hazard at its source by using different engineering controls. Examples include local exhaust ventilation, isolation rooms, machine guarding, acoustic insulating, etc. Fourth, they can minimize the hazard by designing safe work systems and administrative or institutional control measures. Examples include job rotation, training safe work procedures, lockout and tagout, workplace monitoring, limiting, exposure or work duration, etc. Fifth, appropriate personal protective equipment or PPE should be provided along with training, use and maintenance of the PPE. The way a facility is designed for operations during its construction can have a major impact on the environmental, health and safety aspects to the occupants inside the building. Let us take a closer look at these aspects and their effect. The various general facility design and operations include Integrity of workplace structures Workspace and exit Fire precautions First aid Air supply, work environment temperature, safe access, lighting, portable water supply, clean eating area, lavatories and showers. Let us look at each one of them in detail. Let us first learn about how workplace structures can be designed. The permanent and recurrent places of work should be properly designed and equipped to protect OHS. These are the places where the occupants spend most of their time, hence needs to be safe and protected. The surfaces, structures and installations should be easy to clean and maintain. They should not allow for accumulation of any hazardous compounds. The buildings should be designed such that they are structurally safe, provide appropriate protection against the climate and should have acceptable light and noise conditions. The fire-resistant, noise-absorbing materials should be used for cladding on ceilings and walls. The floors should be level, even and non-skid. 
the heavy oscillating, rotating or alternating equipment should be located in dedicated buildings or structurally isolated sections. Next, let's evaluate the design of workspace and exit areas. The space provided for each worker and in total should be adequate for safe execution of all activities. This includes transport and interim storage of materials and products. The facilities should be designed and built taking into account the needs of disabled persons. The passages to emergency exits should be unobstructed at all times. The exits should be clearly marked to be visible even in total darkness. The number and capacity of emergency exits should be sufficient enough for safe and orderly evacuation of the greatest number of people present at any time. Also, there should be a minimum two exits from any work area. Fires can cause havoc to life and property, so the occupants should know the position of fire alarm, extinguishers and all exits of the buildings in which they are working or using. Thus, the workplace should be designed to prevent the start of fires. The fire codes applicable to industrial or commercial buildings should be properly implemented. The workplace should be equipped with facilities like fire detectors, alarm systems and firefighting equipment. They should be in adequate number depending on the dimensions and use of the premises, equipment stalled, physical and chemical properties of substances present and the maximum number of people present. These equipment should be maintained in good working order and be readily accessible. The manuals for firefighting equipment should be easily accessible and simple to use. The fire and emergency alarm systems should be both audible and visible. Accidents can happen anywhere and anytime. So, the first aids can provide an immediate and temporary treatments to the victims. Thus, the employer should ensure that qualified first aid is provided at all times. The first aid stations should be easily accessible throughout the place of work and properly equipped. There should be provision of eye wash stations and emergency showers. These should be located close to all workstations where immediate flushing with water can be done easily. Depending on the nature of work, Dedicated and appropriately equipped first aid rooms should be provided. The first aid stations and rooms should be equipped with gloves, gowns and masks to protect against direct contact with blood and other body fluids. The remote sites should have written emergency procedures to deal with cases of trauma or serious illness up to the point at which patient care can be transferred to an appropriate medical facility. The sufficient fresh air should be supplied for indoor and confined work spaces. The factors that should be considered in ventilation design are physical activity, substances in use and process related emissions. The air distribution systems should be designed to ensure that workers are not exposed to draughts. Mechanical ventilation systems should be maintained in good working order. Point source exhaust systems required for maintaining a safe ambient environment should have local indicators of correct functioning. The recirculation of contaminated air should not be acceptable. Air inlet filters should be kept clean and free of dust and microorganisms. The heating, ventilation and air conditioning that is HVAC and industrial evaporative cooling systems should be equipped, maintained and operated to prevent growth and spreading of disease agents like Legionella pneumophilia or breeding of vectors like mosquitoes and flies for public health concern. The work environment temperature also plays an important role in facility design. During the service hours, the temperature in work, restroom and other welfare facilities should be maintained at a level appropriate for the purpose of the facility. Access to and egress from the workplace are fundamental aspects to the safe working conditions that should prevail within any workplace. Let us understand different safe access methods. The passageways for pedestrians and vehicles within and outside buildings should be segregated and provided for easy, safe and appropriate access. 
the equipment and installations required for servicing, inspection and cleaning should be unobstructed, unrestricted and readily accessible. The hand, knee and foot railings should be installed in stairs, fixed ladders, platforms, permanent and interim floor openings, loading bays, ramps etc. to prevent people from falling. The opening should be sealed by gates or removable chains. The covers should be installed to protect against falling items. Also, measures should be taken to prevent unauthorized access to dangerous areas with the help of appropriate signages. The quality of lighting in a workplace can have a significant effect on productivity. Therefore, the workplaces should receive an adequate amount of natural light. The workplace should also be supplemented with sufficient artificial illumination to promote worker safety and health and enable safe equipment operation. The places with specific visual acuity requirements, the supplemental task lighting may be provided. The workplaces should install emergency lighting of adequate intensity which is automatically activated upon failure of the principal artificial light source to ensure safe shutdown and evacuation. The employer should provide portable water in the workplace. For drinking purposes, an adequate supply of portable drinking water should be provided from a fountain with an upward jet or with a sanitary means of collecting water. The water supplied for food preparation or for personal hygiene like washing or bathing should meet the drinking water quality standards. The eating areas, if exposed to poisonous substances, can lead to indigestion. Therefore, it is necessary that suitable arrangements are made to provide clean eating areas where workers are not exposed to the hazardous or noxious substances. The adequate number of lavatory facilities like toilets and washing areas should be provided based on the number of people expected to work in the facility. Also, allowances should be made for segregated facilities or for indicating whether the toilet facility is in use or vacant. The toilet facilities should also be provided with adequate supplies of hot and cold running water, soap and hand drying devices. The places where workers may be exposed to poisonous substances by ingestion and skin contamination, the facilities for showering and changing into and out of street and work clothes should be provided. One of the biggest tasks faced in ensuring good health and safety practice is the communication of information. It is vital that everyone concerned understands risks and how they should be dealt with. Let us now learn how organizations should communicate about the safety principles and hazards. It is truly essential to have proper signage in a workplace as they provide appropriate instructions or warning or danger or caution or references to the dangers that can be avoided by the employees or workers or even guests in the area. These safety signs should be placed anywhere in which a potential hazard may be found like electrical rooms, compressor rooms, installations, materials, safety measures and emergency exits. The aim is to clearly indicate the danger so that it may be avoided. The different types of signages may include warnings about fire hazard, chemical hazard, danger board, PPE warnings, wet caution sign, exit signs, etc. Proper signage should be placed according to international standards. Workers, visitors or general public should be able to recognize and easily understand these signage appropriately. The proper labeling of any material or equipment is equally important to identify them quickly. By reading the labels and using color codes, one can know the contents, type of hazard, if any, and its chemical or toxicological properties including temperature or pressure of any substance. Similarly, the piping systems that contain hazardous substances should be labelled with the direction of flow and contents of the pipe. It should also be colour-coded if the pipe passing through a wall or floor is interrupted by a wall or junction device. Communicating the hazard codes to the workers and the visitors is necessary. 
copies of the hazard coding system should be posted outside the facility at emergency entrance doors and fire emergency connection systems, where they are likely to come to the attention of emergency services personnel. Also, the information regarding the types of hazardous materials stored, handled or used at the facility, including typical maximum inventories and storage locations, should be shared proactively with emergency services and security personnel to expedite emergency response when needed. The representatives of local emergency and security services should be invited to participate in periodic, that is annual, orientation tours and site inspections to ensure familiarity with potential hazards present. Physical hazards are the most common hazard and are present in most workplaces at one time or another. These hazards represent the accident or injury or illness caused due to repetitive exposure to mechanical action or work activity. The single exposure to physical hazards may result in a wide range of injuries ranging from minor and medical aid only to disabling, catastrophic and fatal. The multiple exposure over prolonged periods can result in disabling injuries of comparable significance and consequence. Let's study more about physical hazards in subsequent screens. Noise is one of the most common workplace health hazards in heavy industrial and manufacturing environments as well as in farms, cafeterias, permanent hearing loss is the main health concern. The hearing protection devices should be actively enforced when the equivalent sound level over 8 hours reaches 85 decibels or the peak sound levels reach 140 decibel or the average maximum sound level reaches 110 decibels. The hearing protective devices should be capable of reducing sound levels at the ear to at least 85 decibels. Rather than using devices for longer period, try limiting the duration of noise exposure. For every 3 decibel increase in sound levels, the allowed exposure period or duration should be reduced by 50%. Prior to the issuance of hearing protective devices as the final control mechanism, one should also investigate and implement other measures as well. You can use acoustic insulating materials, isolate the noise source or use other engineering controls. Also, medical hearing checks should be performed periodically on workers when exposed to high noise levels. Vibration can cause long-term painful damage to a worker's hands and fingers. Thus, the exposure to hand-arm vibration from equipment such as hand and power tools or whole body vibrations from surfaces on which the worker stands or sits should be controlled using choice of equipment, installing the vibration dampening pads or devices and by limiting the duration of exposure. Why should we be concerned about electrical hazards? The exposed or faulty electrical devices such as circuit breakers, panels, cables, cords and hand tools can pose a serious risk to workers. The overhead wires can also be struck by metal devices such as poles or ladders and by vehicles with metal booms. Thus, if vehicles or grounded metal objects are brought into close proximity with overhead wires, they can result in arcing between the wires and the object without actual contact. It is important that proper measures are taken to prevent electrical hazards at the workplace. An overview on different recommended actions are as follows. Mark all energized electrical devices and lines with warning signs. Lock out and tag out the devices during service or maintenance. Lock out means decharging and leaving open with a controlled locking device. Tag out refers to placing a warning sign on the lock. Properly check all electrical cords, cables and hand power tools for frayed or exposed cords and follow the manufacturer recommendations for maximum permitted operating voltage of the portable hand tools. Perform double insulation or grounding all electrical equipment used in the wet environments using equipment with ground fault interrupter that is GFI protected circuits. 
protect the power cords and extension cords against damage from traffic by shielding or suspending them above traffic areas. Conduct detailed identification and marking of all barred electrical wiring prior to any excavation work. Label the service rooms appropriately. Establish a no approach zones around or under high voltage power. The rubber tired construction or other vehicles that come into direct contact with high voltage wires should be taken out of service for periods of 48 hours. Replace the tires to prevent catastrophic tire and wheel assembly failure, potentially causing serious injury or death. Thousands of people are blinded each year from work-related eye injuries that could have been prevented with the proper selection and use of eye and face protection. The solid particles from a wide variety of industrial operations or from a liquid chemical spray may strike a worker in the eye causing an eye injury or permanent blindness. The recommended measures to prevent eye hazards are use equipment like machine guards or splash shields and face and eye protection devices such as safety glasses with size shields, goggles and a full face shield. The specific safe operating procedures that is SOPs should be used while working on sanding and grinding tools and when working around liquid chemicals. These equipment should be frequently checked to ensure the mechanical integrity. The machine and equipment guarding should confirm to standards published by the appropriate authorities. The moving areas where the discharge of solid fragments, liquid or gaseous emissions are high, these must be located away from transient workers or visitors. Examples of such places include discharge of sparks from a metal cutting station and pressure relief valve discharge. The machines or work fragments that could present a hazard to transient workers or passers-by, an extra area guarding or proximity restricting systems should be implemented. Ensure required PPE is available for these transient workers and visitors. The persons with prescription glasses should wear them either through the use over glasses or prescribed hardened glasses. Next, physical hazard is hazard due to welding and hot work. The process of welding creates an extremely bright and intense light that may seriously injure a worker's eyesight. In extreme cases, this may lead to blindness. Additionally, welding may also produce noxious fumes to which prolonged exposure can cause serious chronic diseases. Let us learn about preventive measures from welding and hot works. Provide proper eye protection devices such as welder goggles and a full face eye shield for all personnel involved and assisting in welding operations. Additional methods may include the use of welding barrier screens around the specific workstation. These barrier screens are a solid piece of light metal, canvas or plywood that are designed to block welding light from others. The devices to extract and remove noxious fumes at the source may also be required. Special hot work and fire prevention precautions and standard operating procedures, that is SOPs, should be implemented if welding or hot cutting is undertaken outside established welding workstations. These may include hot work permits, standby fire extinguishers, standby fire watch and maintaining the fire watch for up to one hour after welding or hot cutting has terminated. Special procedures are also required for hot work on tanks or vessels that contains flammable materials. Falling from heights are one of the biggest hazards at the construction sites and are major cause of workplace fatalities and major injuries. Common causes are falls from ladders and through fragile roofs. The organizations should have fall prevention and protection measures to prevent death and injury from a fall from height. These measures should be implemented whenever a worker is exposed to the hazard of falling from more than 2 meters. The worker may fall into operating machinery, into water or other liquid, into hazardous substances or through an opening in a work surface. These measures may also be warranted on a case-specific basis when there are risks of falling from lesser heights. 
The measures that can be used for fall prevention may include installing guardrails with mid rails and tow boards at the edge of any fall hazard area. Properly using ladders and scaffolds by trained employees. Using fall prevention devices including safety belt and lanyard travel limiting devices to prevent access to fall hazard area. Using fall protection devices such as full body harnesses, shock absorbing lanyards or self retracting inertial fall arrest devices attached to fixed anchor point or horizontal lifelines. Providing appropriate training, serviceability and integrity of the necessary PPE. Incorporating proper rescue and recovery plans and equipment to respond to workers after an arrested fall. Every workplace has chemicals ranging from cleaning products to full-scale chemical production. If chemicals are not used, stored and handled properly, they can cause injury, illness, disease, fire, explosions or property damage. So, it is important to know about hazards of chemicals and appropriate precautions to take to work safely and avoid injury. The chemical hazards represents the illnesses or injury caused due to single or chronic repetitive exposure to toxic, corrosive, sensitizing or oxidative substances. They also include a risk of uncontrolled reaction and the risk of fire and exposure if incompatible chemicals are inadvertently mixed. The chemical hazards can be effectively prevented by following a hierarchical approach. Replace the hazardous substance with a less hazardous substitute. Implement engineering and administrative control measures to avoid or minimize the release of hazardous substances into the work environment and keeping the level of exposure below internationally established or recognized limits. Keep the number of employees exposed or likely to become exposed to a minimum. Communicate chemical hazards to workers with the help of labeling and marking according to national and internationally recognized requirements and standards. These standards include the International Chemical Safety Cards that is ICSC, Material Safety Data Sheets that is MSDS or Equivalent. Train workers on how to use MSDSs, safe work practices and appropriate use of PPE. Train workers on how to use MSDSs, safe work practices and appropriate use of PPE. Now, let's see various chemical hazards prevention measures. Poor air quality due to the release of contaminants into the workplace can result in respiratory irritation, discomfort or illness to workers. The employer should take appropriate measures to maintain air quality in the work area. The preventive measures for preserving air quality includes Maintaining levels of contaminant dusts, vapors and gases in the work environment at concentrations below those recommended by the appropriate authorities. Examples of these authorities include pollution control boards and other international standards. The cases where ambient air contains several materials that have additive effects on the same body organs, one should take into account combined exposures using calculations. Fire safety becomes everyone's job at a work site. Employers should train workers about fire hazards in the workplace and about what to do in a fire emergency. The fires and or explosions resulting from ignition of flammable materials or gases can lead to loss of property, possible injury or fatalities to project workers. The different prevention and control strategies include the flammables, should be stored away from ignition sources and oxidizing materials. The flammable storage area should be located remotely from entry and exit points into buildings, located away from facility ventilation intakes or vents, have natural or passive floor and ceiling level ventilation and explosion venting, use spark proof fixtures, equipped with fire extinguishing devices and self-closing doors. Constructed of materials that can withstand flame impingement for a moderate period of time. 
Workplace should provide bonding and grounding between containers. Provide additional mechanical floor level ventilation if materials are dispensed in the storage area. If the flammable material is mainly comprised of dust, electrical grounding, spark detection and quenching systems should be provided. Let's now understand what PPE is and why it is important. The Personal Protective Equipment or PPE provides additional protection to workers if exposed to workplace hazards. It works in conjunction with other facility controls and safety systems and provides worker with an extra level of personal protection. Now, let's discuss some of the recommended measures for using PPE in the workplace. The PPE should be actively used if alternative technologies, work plans or procedures cannot eliminate or sufficiently reduce a hazard or exposure. Appropriate PPE should be identified and provided to the worker, co-workers and occasional visitors to offer adequate protection without incurring unnecessary inconvenience to the individual. Proper maintenance of PPE should be done. This includes cleaning when dirty and replacing equipment when damaged or worn out. Proper use of PPE should be part of the recurrent training programs for the employees. The PPE should be selected based on the hazard and risk ranking described earlier in this section and according to criteria on performance and testing established by recognized organizations. Special hazard environments are work situations where all of the previously described hazards may exist under unique or specially hazardous circumstances. Thus, extra and rigorous precautions are required. Some of the examples include confined spaces, lone and isolated workers and monitoring. Let's learn about each of them in detail in subsequent screens. First, special hazard environment is confined space, which can be defined as a wholly or partially enclosed space, not designed or intended for human occupancy since all the hazards are found in a regular workspace, such as air quality, chemical exposures and fires can also be found in a confined space. A hazardous atmosphere could develop in a confined space as a result of the contents, location or construction of the confined space or due to work done in or around the confined space. These can occur in enclosed or open structures or locations. If anyone tries to enter or escape through a confined space without any prior precaution or preparation, it can result in serious injury or fatality. Following are the recommended management approaches for a confined space. The engineering measures should be implemented to eliminate to the degree feasible the existence and adverse character of confined spaces. The access hatches should accommodate 90% of the worker population along with adjustments for tools and protective clothing. The area adjoining an access to a confined space should provide ample room for emergency and rescue operations. The safety precautions should include Self-contained breathing apparatus that is SCBA, lifelines and safety watch workers stationed outside the confined space with rescue and first aid equipment readily available. Before entering the confined space, workers should get adequate and appropriate training. Training includes confined space hazard control, atmospheric testing, use of the necessary PPE, Verification of serviceability and integrity of the PPE. Further adequate and appropriate rescue and recovery plans and equipment should be in place. A permit required confined space is one that also contains physical or atmospheric hazards that could trap or engulf the person. The permit required confined spaces should be provided with permanent safety measures for venting, monitoring and rescue operations. Prior to entry into a permit required confined space, process of feed lines into the space should be disconnected or drained and blanked and locked out. 
mechanical equipment in the space should be disconnected, de-energized, logged out and braced as appropriate. The atmosphere within the confined space should be tested to ensure the oxygen content is between 19.5% and 23% and that the presence of any flammable gas or vapor does not exceed 25% of its respective lower explosive limit, that is LEL. If the atmospheric conditions are not met, the confined space should be ventilated until the target safe atmosphere is achieved or entry is only to be undertaken with appropriate and additional PPE. While it is not always hazardous to work alone, it can be hazardous when other circumstances are present. Alone, an isolated worker is a worker which is out of verbal and line of sight communication with a supervisor, other workers or other persons capable of providing aid and assistance for continuous periods exceeding one hour. The worker is therefore at increased risk should an accident or injury occur. Let's learn about preventive measures in different scenarios. If the workers are required to work under loan or isolated circumstances, the standard operating procedures or SOPs should be developed and implemented. These must ensure that all PPE and safety measures are in place before the worker starts work. SOPs should establish a verbal contact with the worker at least once every hour and should ensure the worker has a capability for summoning emergency aid. If the worker is potentially exposed to highly toxic or corrosive chemicals, the workplace should be equipped with emergency eye wash and shower facilities and audible and visible alarms. These should summon aid to worker whenever the eye wash or shower is activated and should work without intervention by the worker. Once the occupational health and safety monitoring programs are set up, it is necessary to verify the effectiveness of prevention and control strategies. The selected indicators should represent the most significant occupational health and safety hazards and implement prevention and control strategies. Let us understand various occupational health and safety monitoring programs. First, let's discuss about safety inspection, testing and calibration. There should be regular inspection and testing of all safety features and hazard control measures. This should focus on engineering and personal protective features, work procedures, places of work, installations, equipment and tools used. The inspection should also verify if issued PPE continues to provide adequate protection and is worn as required. All the instruments installed or used for monitoring and recording of working environment parameters should be regularly tested, calibrated and maintained. The surveillance of the working environment is also equally important. The employers should document compliance using an appropriate combination of portable and stationary sampling and monitoring instruments. The monitoring and analysis should be conducted according to internationally recognized methods and standards. Monitoring methodology, locations, frequencies and parameters should be established individually for each project following a review of the hazards. Generally, Monitoring should be performed during commissioning of facilities or equipment and at the end of the defect and liability period and otherwise repeated according to the monitoring plan. Surveillance of the workers' health Apart from surveillance of the working environment, surveillance of workers' health is also equally important. When extraordinary protective measures are required, for example, against biological agents, groups 3 and 4 and or hazardous compounds, workers should be provided appropriate and relevant health surveillance prior to first exposure and at regular intervals thereafter. The surveillance should also be deemed necessary even after termination of the employment. The training activities for employees and visitors should be adequately monitored and documented. Curriculum, duration and participants. Emergency exercises including fire drills, should be documented adequately. Service providers and contractors should be contractually required to submit to the employer adequate training documentation before start of their assignment.
Let us now learn about different EHS inspection priorities. They are fire safety, the inspection of facilities from a fire safety perspective should be done at least annually. Chemical safety, the inspection of use of chemicals and the spaces where chemicals are being used should be done at regular frequency. Radiation safety, the inspection of radioactive materials, laboratories and handling of radioactive material should be done according to policy. Workplace safety, the inspection in areas that fall under the hazards management plan should be monitored according to the policy. Biological safety. The inspection of biological hazards and spaces with potential of biological contamination should be conducted at least annually. Let us now understand how EHS programs impacts the businesses. EHS programs at work show employees that companies care about their well-being. The effective implementation of the EHS best practices, training and knowledge makes the workplace safer, healthier and environment friendly. It helps in reducing the number of incidents and fatalities at workplace, which has a positive effect on employee morale, retention and even hiring. Also, EHS program helps in increasing customer loyalty. Many new customers today Consider these issues before deciding on which company to work with. The safety audits and inspections at regular intervals are very important for successful accident prevention programs. An effective safety audit inspection program helps in improving the working condition of the worker, worker communication, company morale over time and helps in saving the employer money. Identifying potential EHS risks and Taking the necessary measures to deal with them quickly and effectively can result in cost savings. These also helps in removing the risk of unnecessary downtime, avoiding preventable injuries and preventing environmental disasters. It is important that the hazardous conditions are reported. Here is the list of various types of hazardous conditions that should be reported. Unsafe work practices, suspected health hazards, failure to wear required personal protective equipment that is PPE, failure to guard machines and cutting instruments, improper storage of chemical supplies and other excess materials, presence of irritating or noxious odours, fire hazards, interference with safe egress, natural gas odours, chemical spills, Mercury spills, petroleum or gasoline spills, compressed gas release, radiation exposure or contamination. Here is the summary of what you have learned so far. You should now be able to understand what EHS is and why it is required. Understand various prevention and control measures. Overview on occupational health and safety that is OHS. Examine different PPE techniques and hazards. Describe various EHS inspection priorities, understand how EHS impacts the businesses and determine conditions that should be reported.